The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak The Whistler and the Shoes The same pattern continued through the end of summer and well into autumn. Rudy did his best to survive the Hitler youth. Max did his push-ups and made his sketches. Liesl found newspapers and wrote her words on the basement wall. It's also worthy of mention that every pattern has at least one small bias, and one day it will tip itself over or fall from one page to another. In this case, the dominant factor was Rudy, or at least Rudy in a freshly fertilized sports field. Late in October, all appeared to be usual. A filthy boy was walking down Himmel Street. Within a few minutes, his family would expect his arrival and he would lie that everyone in his Hitler Youth Division was given extra drills in the field. His parents would even expect some laughter. They didn't get it. Today, Rudy was all out of laughter and lies. On this particular Wednesday, when Lisa looked more closely, she could see that Rudy Steiner was shirtless, and he was furious. What happened? she asked as he trudged past. He reversed back and held out the shirt. Smell it, he said. What? Are you deaf? I said smell it. Reluctantly, Lisa leaned in and caught a ghastly whiff of the brown garment. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, is that? The boy nodded. It's on my chin, too. My chin? I'm like I didn't swallow it. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. The field at Hitler Youth just got fertilized. He gave his shirt another half-hearted, disgusted appraisal. It's cow manure, I think. Did what's-his-name Ducher know it was there? He says he didn't, but he was grinning. Jesus, Marion, could you stop saying that? What Rudy needed at this point in time was a victory. He had lost in his dealings with Victor Kemmel. He'd endured problem after problem at the Hitler Youth. All he wanted was a small scrap of triumph and he was determined to get it. He continued home, but when he reached the concrete step, he changed his mind and came slowly, purposefully back to the girl. Careful and quiet, he spoke. You know what would cheer me up? Liesl cringed. If you think I'm going to, in that state? He seemed disappointed in her. No, not that. He sighed and stepped closer something else. After a moment's thought, he raised his head just a touch. Look at me. I'm filthy. I stink like cow shit or dog shit, whatever your opinion. And as usual, I'm absolutely starving. He paused. I need a win, Liesl. Honestly. Liesl knew. She'd have gone closer, but for the smell of him. Stealing. They had to steal something. No. They had to steal something back. It didn't matter what, it needed only to be soon. Just you and me this time, Rudy suggested. No camels, no Schmeichels, just you and me. The girl couldn't help it. Her hands itched, her pulse split, and her mouth smiled all, the sa all at the same time. Sounds good. It's agreed then, and although he tried not to, Rudy could not hide the fertilized grain that grew on his face. Tomorrow? Liesl nodded. Tomorrow. Their plan was perfect, but for one thing. They had no idea where to start. Fruit was out. Rudy snubbed his nose at onions and potatoes, and they drew the line at another attempt on Otto Sturm and his bike full of farm produce. Once was immoral. Twice was complete bastardry. So where the hell do we go? Rudy asked. How should I know? This is your idea, wasn't it? That doesn't mean you shouldn't think a little, too. I can't think of everything. You can barely think of anything. They argued on as they walked through town. On the outskirts, they witnessed the first of the farms and the trees standing like emaciated statues. The branches were gray, and when they looked up at them, there was nothing but ragged limbs and empty sky. Rudy spat. They walked back through mulking, making suggestions. What about Frau Diller? What about her? Maybe if we say Heil Hitler and then steal something, we'll be all right. After roaming Munich Street for an hour or so, the daylight was drawing to a close and they were on the verge of giving up. 
It's pointless, Rudy said, and I'm even hungrier now than I've ever been. I'm starving, for Christ's sake. He walked another dozen steps before he stopped and looked back. What's with you? Because now Liesl was standing completely still, and a moment of realization was strapped to her face. Why hadn't she thought of it before? What is it? Rudy was becoming impatient. Salmonch, what's going on? At that very moment, Liesl was presented with a decision. Could she truly carry out what she was thinking? Could she really seek revenge on a person like this? Could she despise someone this much? She began walking in the opposite direction. When Rudy caught up, she slowed a little in the vain hope of achieving a little more clarity. After all, the guilt was already there. It was moist. The seed was already bursting into a dark-leafed flower. She weighed up whether she could really go through with this. At a crossroad, she stopped. I know a place. They went over the river and made their way up the hill. On Grand Strasse, they took in the splendor of the houses. The front doors glowed with polish, and the roof tiles sat like toupees, combed to perfection. The walls and windows were manicured, and the chimneys almost breathed out smoke rings. Rudy planted his feet. The mayor's house? Liesel nodded, seriously. A pause. They fired my mama. When they angled toward it, Rudy asked just how in God's name they were going to get inside, but Liesel knew. Local knowledge, she answered. Local. But when they were able to see the window to the library at the far end of the house, she was greeted with a shock. The window was closed. Well? Rudy asked. Liesl swiveled slowly and hurried off. Not today, she said. Rudy laughed. I knew it, he caught up. I knew it, you filthy salmonch. You couldn't get in there even if you had the key. Do you mind? She quickened even more and brushed aside Rudy's commentary. We just have to wait for the right opportunity. Internally, she shrugged away from a kind of gladness that the window was closed. She berated herself. Why, Liesl? she asked. Why did you have to explode when they fired Mama? Why couldn't you just keep your big mouth shut? For all you know, the mayor's wife is now completely reformed after he yelled and screamed at her. Maybe she straightened herself out, picked herself up. Maybe she'll never let herself shiver in that house again, and the window will be shut forever. You stupid salmonch. A week later, however, on their fifth visit to the upper part of Mulking, it was there. The open window breathed a slice of air in. That was all it would take. It was Rudy who stopped first. He tapped Liesl in the ribs with the back of his hand. Is that window, he whispered, open? The eagerness in his voice leaned from his mouth like a forearm onto Liesl's shoulder. Jawol, she answered. It sure is. And how her heart began to heat. On each previous occasion, when they found the window clamped firmly shut, Liesl's outer disappointment had masked a ferocious relief. Would she, have the ne would she have had the neck to go in? And who and what, in fact, was she going in for? For Rudy? To locate some food? No, the repugnant truth was this. She didn't care about the food. Rudy, no matter how hard she tried to resist the idea, was secondary to her plan. It was the book she wanted, The Whistler. She wouldn't tolerate having it given to her by a lonely, pathetic old woman. Stealing it, on the other hand, seemed a little more acceptable. Stealing it, in a sick kind of sense, was like earning it. The light was changing in blocks of shade. The pair of them gravitated toward the immaculate, bulky house. They rustled their thoughts. You hungry? Rudy asked. Liesl replied, starving for a book. Look, a light just came on upstairs. I see it. Still hungry, Salmonch? They laughed nervously for a moment before going through the motions of who should go in and, what, and who should stand watch. As the male in the operation, Rudy clearly felt that he would be the aggressor, but it was obvious that Liesl knew this place. It was she who was going in. She knew it was on the other side of the window. She said it. It has to be me. Liesl closed her eyes, tightly. She compelled herself to remember 
to see visions of the mayor and his wife. She watched her gathered friendship with Ilsa Herman and made sure to see it kicked in the shins and left by the wayside. It worked. She detested them. They scouted the street and crossed the yard silently. Now they were crouched beneath the slit in the window on the ground floor. The sound of their breathing amplified. Here, Rudy said. Give me your shoes. You'll be quieter. Without complaint, Lisa undid the worn black laces and left the shoes on the ground. She rose up and Rudy gently opened the window just wide enough for Lisa to climb through. The noise of it passed overhead like a low-flying plane. Liesl heaved herself onto the ledge and tussled her way inside. Taking off her shoes, she realized was a brilliant idea, as she landed much heavier on the wooden floor than she'd anticipated. The soles of her feet expanded in that painful way, rising to the inside edges of her socks. The room itself was as it always was. Liesl, in the dusty dimness, shrugged off her feelings of nostalgia. She crept forward and allowed her eyes to adjust. What's going on? Rudy whispered sharply from outside, but she waved him a backhander that meant halt small. Keep quiet. The food, he reminded her. Find the food and cigarettes if you can. Both items, however, were the last things on her mind. She was home among the mayor's books of every color and description with their silver and gold lettering. She could smell the pages. She could almost taste the words they stacked up around her. Her feet took her to the right-hand wall. She knew the one she wanted, the exact position. But when she made it to the whistler's usual place on the shelf, it was not there. A slight gap was in its place. From above, she heard footsteps. The light, Rudy whispered. The words were shoved through the open window. It's out. Sheesh. They're coming downstairs. There was a giant length of moment of a moment then, the eternity of a split-second decision. Her eyes scanned the room, and she could see the whistler sitting patiently on the mayor's desk. Hurry up, Rudy warned her. But very calmly and cleanly, Lisa walked over, picked up the book, and made her way cautiously out. Head first, she climbed from the window, managing to land on her feet again, feeling the pain of pain once more, this time in her ankles. Come on, Rudy and Porter. Run, run, Schnell. Once outside the corner, on the road back down to the river and Munich Street, she stopped to bend over and recover. Her body was folded in the middle, with the air half frozen in her mouth, her heart tolling in her ears. Rudy was the same. When he looked over, he saw the book under her arm. He struggled to speak. What's... He grappled with the words. With the book... The darkness was filling up truly now. Liesl panted, the air in her throat defrosting. It was all I could find. Unfortunately, Rudy could smell it. The lie. He cocked his head and told her what he felt was a fact. You didn't go in for food, did you? You got what you wanted. Liesl straightened then and was overcome with the sickness of another realization. The shoes. She looked at Rudy's feet, then at his hands and at the ground all around him. What? he asked. What is it? So, Carol, she accused him. Where are my shoes? Rudy's face whitened, which left her in no doubt. They're back at the house, she suggested, aren't they? Rudy searched desperately around himself, begging against all reality that he might have brought them with him. He imagined himself picking them up, wishing it was true, but the shoes were not there. They sat uselessly, or actually much worse, incriminatingly, by the wall at eight Grandstrasse. Dumb cough, he astonished he admonished himself, smacking his ear. He looked down shamefully at the sullen sight of Liesl's socks. Idiot. It didn't take him long to decide on making it right. Earnestly, he said, Just wait. And he hurried back around the corner. Don't get caught, Liesl called after him, but he didn't hear. The minutes were heavy while he was gone. Darkness was now complete, and Liesl was quite certain that Avarchin was most likely in the cards when she returned home. Hurry, she murmured, but still Rudy didn't appear. She imagined the sound of a police siren throwing itself forward and reeling itself in, collecting itself. 
Still nothing. Only when she walked back to the intersection of the two streets in her lamp, in her damp, dirty socks, did she see him. Rudy's triumphant face was held nicely up as he trotted steadily toward her. His teeth were gnashed into a grin, and the shoes dangled from his hand. Ne they nearly killed me, he said, but I made it. Once they'd crossed the river, he handed Liesel the shoes, and she threw them down. Sitting on the ground, she looked up at her best friend. Danke, she said. Thank you. Rudy bowed. My pleasure. He tried for a little more. No point asking if I get a kiss for that, I guess. For bringing my shoes, which you left behind? Fair enough. He held up his hands and continued, speaking as they walked on, and Liesl made a concerted effort to ignore him. To ignore him, She only heard the last part. Probably wouldn't want to kiss you anyway. Not if your breath's anything like your shoes. You disgust me, she informed him, and she hoped he, he couldn't see the escaped beginnings of a smile that had fallen from her mouth. On Himmel Street, Rudy captured the book. Under a lamppost, he read out the title and wondered what it was about. Dreamily, Liesel answered, Just a murderer. Is that all? There's also a policeman trying to catch him. Rudy handed it back. Speaking of which, I think we're both slightly in for it when we get home. You especially. Why me? You know, your mama. What about her? Liesel was exercising the blatant right of every person who ever belonged to a family. It was all very well for such a person to whine and moan and criticize other family members, but they won't let anyone else do it. That's when you get your back up and show loyalty. Is there anything wrong with her? Rudy backed away. Sorry, Salmanch, I didn't mean to offend you. Even in the night, Liesel could see that Rudy was growing. His face was lengthening. The blonde shock of hair was darkening ever so slightly, and his features seemed to be changing shape. But there was one thing that would never change. It was impossible to be angry at him for long. Anything good to eat at your place tonight? he asked. I doubt it. Me neither. It's a shame you can't eat books. Arthur Berg said something like that once. Remember? They recounted the old, the good old days for the remainder of the walk, Liesl often glancing down at the whistler, at the gray cover and the black imprinted title. Before they went into their respective homes, Rudy stopped a moment and said, Goodbye, Salmanch. He laughed. Good night, book thief. It was the first time Liesl had been branded with her title and she couldn't hide the fact that she liked it very much. As we're both aware, she'd stolen books previously, but in late October 1941, it became official. That night, Lisa Leminger truly became the book thief.